Right, so like I had talked about before, construction grain began in 1968. Fun story, uh, they were actually going to build this facility down at the Guadalupe Napomo Dunes on the, mm -hmm. on the beach, kind of like they built San Onofre. And the Sierra Club said, please build it in Diablo Canyon. And now the Sierra Club hates it, you know, it's kinda, they kind of hate it. So we had a letter from them that says, like, dear gentle sirs of pg &E, like, please like, Move, consider yeah. please consider building it in Diablo Canyon that no one cares about, but now everybody you know, cares about it. It is crazy how many different sites people propose up and down the coast of yeah. down by us and up and down. Yeah. Yeah, really neat story about this place is, is actually going to be six units. So we would have had six of those containment wow. domes. Um, because when they first built it, they're like, oh, this is only going to cost $150 million. This is great. And then it was like a billion dollars per unit. And so the cost kind of got out of control. Um, and, and public perception about this facility changed. This was like the start of civil disobedience. Huge movement. Uh, people, that's why we have such a giant property. Like if you drive by San Onofre, it's a tiny, yeah. tiny little area. And you could drive by on the freeway. We have, you know, miles on every side of us because we had people just hiking in here, protesting, uh, trying to get this place to shut down. Uh, people did not want this place to be built. There was like, like Bob Dylan came, like they were singing songs like out in front of the front gate, and it was a, it was a really big deal. Uh, so, anyways, like I had said before, 1970, the Hosgrave Fault was discovered. So at that point, there was pretty significant seismic redesign that needed to be done. At that point. Um, there was also the Three Mile Island incident that resulted in the simulator training building needing to be built. So all these things kind of delayed the opening and the commercial operation of the facility. Uh, and like I had said before, because in 1968 there was no Coastal Act or CEQA, that was all in the 70s. Uh, so a lot of this, these buildings predate that, so we didn't have to apply for coastal development permits. It was a permit from the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission. If you could prove a public benefit for the power, you got a permit to construct, and then then you got to go build your power plant. Now, <laughs> now you have the coastal zone, and there's actually an area that I'll point out where um, there's these scenic rocks along the coast of California that's managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And so you have five regulators all in the same area. You have BLM, you have coastal zone, you have California State Lands Commission for submerged tile lands, uh, the coastal zone has original uh, permit jurisdiction out to three miles out. Uh, you have the county of San Luis Obispo, and then there's one more, I'm missing one. But uh, anyways, yeah, you have all four to five entities controlling like the same rock, basically. And you have to get all these people to play ball anytime you go to apply for a permit to do anything. So the permitting out here is extremely complicated, very political, yeah. uh, and we have a whole group in Sacramento that's dedicated to those sort of relationships. Uh, and that works with those people, brings people out here, like you guys are here for a tour, um, so people can see the facility. Uh, commercial operations began uh, May 7th, 1985 for Unit 1, uh, March 3rd, 1986 for Unit 2. Uh, it's been a very successful and safely run facility. Uh, unit 1 hasn't had a trip where they've had to go offline unplanned, we call it a reactor trip. Uh, I think it's been 20 years since that's happened. Uh, and I think in uh, 2005, uh, Unit 1 received an award for the longest continuous run. Uh, so it's been a very successful and safely managed facility for some time. Um, we have our used fuel management, like I mentioned before, there's the used fuel ponds where we let the used fuel cool and where we have new fuel that comes in to be stored. Uh, we store all that here on site. Uh, we also had to build a storage facility. So once that pool, or the, excuse me, the fuel has cooled in the pool for a period of seven to 10 years, we take that fuel out of the pool and we put it into what's called dry cast storage. And I have a short little <coughs> video that'll explain to you guys what that is. But we had to build this really large pad to house these containers. And that was our second coastal development permit to build that facility, which resulted in the Point Bouchon trail system. It was a mitigation for coastal access. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned in my van, there's the Petro Coast Trail that's open a couple days a week, the docent led trail that goes out to the San Luis Lighthouse. Uh, that trail system was created from the first coastal development permit uh, for the simulator and training building. So every time we apply for a coastal development permit, the Coastal Commission kind of comes at you for what you got, what do you have for coastal more access? access yeah. yeah, we want more and more access, um, which honestly is, is, a good, is a good thing. I mean, the Point Bichon trail system is incredible so so the pedro trail how many people a week go on that so hike? it's a docent led 
and I think they take about 20 people at a time, and they okay. do it two days a week. They do Wednesdays and Saturdays. So 40-ish people. 40-ish people. A week. Yeah, and okay. and and it's limited for that because of those resources we spoke about. Mm -hmm. We don't want people coming out here and taking resources off the land. We don't. You know, when we had I mentioned the wildflower bloom. We had people coming out and doing the wildflower angels laying and the you know right. the flowers and that's why we limit the amount of people that can come out here and why the community is really concerned about what's going to happen to this place moving forward like is it going to be uh, state parks if you end up at montana de oro or some places like that um, you, the way i always explain it cal poly will come out here and do a marine sciences class they use our tide pools as a control because they're so well preserved because no one is allowed to walk on them. If you go to State Park just north of here, you might as well be walking on an asteroid because people walk all over everything and it's totally loved to death. So it's a fine balance though. You don't wanna completely close it off, but you still wanna maintain some level of access, but it's a really, really fine balance and you have a lot of competing interests uh, for people that wanna come and use it. Uh, so that portion of it is probably just as difficult or more difficult than the permitting aspect of it. Uh, so it's a fine, it's a fine balance for sure. Oh my gosh. So uh, the quick whitewashed history of the <laughs> license renewal process. Uh, we announced license renewal for the plant in 2009. Uh, in 2016, we terminated that, uh, that process. Uh, the state, we're a regulated utility, so uh, I think like you had asked me, like, what is PG&E's stance on license renewal? It's like, well, we're a regulated utility, so we do what the state tells us to do. So when they say, Diablo Canyon, you must close, there's no public benefit here, we have to close it. And we can make arguments one way or the other, but ultimately the decision rests with the state and the regulators. Can you talk about, like, the, the 2016 termination was really seemed really abrupt from the outside. Like all, all of a sudden it seemed like, oh, we're just, we're, we're ceasing our effort to. So I mean, really what happened is that our opponents were really successful in trying to remove Diablo Canyon from the renewables equation. And that was something that happened kind of across mm -hmm. the country. And you saw like over the last few years, you saw like Ohio, right? Said, uh, you know, nuclear is renewable. Nuclear is considered green because it's not technically renewable, right? We have this fuel that we use. Mm -hmm. And so our opponents kind of use that against us where they say, well, Diablo Canyon is not renewable. So we got into this you know, mindset where we need renewables when really what you need is carbon-free energy. That's not something that people are talking about. Even hydro didn't come. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our hydro facilities that were smaller, that didn't produce a lot of power, that we needed to relicense, which Relicensing hydro facilities is probably more complicated than Diablo in some ways. Really? Oh yeah, because you work through the uh, through FERC. Are you familiar with FERC, mm -hmm. Federal Energy Regulatory they, they are. Commission? They yeah. Are. So, I mean, they'll be like, "Hey, PG&E, like you have a lot of money, so we need a campground and we need, uh, you know, a new boat launch and all this stuff." And you end up spending so much money to try and relicense a facility that doesn't count to your renewable uh, energy portfolio, uh, and then you're spending all this money to put in all this new, these new facilities. And so we've, we've actually divested a lot of our smaller hydro projects mm. that you've probably seen in the news. Mm. That's, that's one of the reasons why. So now California's made this decision that one, we don't have as much renewable energy coming online as we thought. Only about 50% of the renewable projects proposed ever make it to an actual build. Uh, There's another permitting question. Right, and it takes a lot longer to build them than, than people realize. So. Uh, one, that was another reason why people thought Diablo needed to shut down is because they want to build offshore wind. And so this is a great landing spot for it, but we're using the line. Well, if Diablo wasn't here, then you'd be able to build offshore wind turbines. But they thought that that would be online starting about now, but now it's looking like maybe 2030, 2035 at the earliest. Um, so it took a long time for the Navy to release some of these areas. So incredibly complicated right. uh, regulatory structure along the coast of California. Um, let's see, and then in, this California Public Utilities Commission, they approved the closure of Diablo Canyon in 2018. We went through a really large decommissioning effort. We applied for a coastal development permit and a land use permit uh, to San Luis Obispo County for our decommissioning activities, which was going to include the complete removal of basically every restructure on site. Uh, we did work with Cal Poly and some other entities. We, we probably would have rolled some of that back. Cal Poly was interested in using this facility as a, as a campus. 
I mentioned the simulator and training buildings, those are like classrooms, so it would have been mm -hmm. a slam dunk for Cal Poly to come in here and they could have held mm -hmm. classes and had to make very little changes to the facility. Um, yeah, and that was in 2021. I mentioned the decommissioning community engagement panel. We use that as a bridge to the local community to try to receive input to see what they wanted to see here, uh, to try and remove local opposition to the project and get people behind the fact that, yeah, this place is closing, but it could be something. It, there's gonna be some benefit to the community. The breakwater, namely, there's not a lot of calm water ports in this area, and so it's gonna be a really valuable commodity. And then we get into the license renewal process round two. I think I was having lunch with someone when we saw the uh, Governor Newsom at LA Times editorial. It was uh, another guy that um, is a senior director for decommissioning at higher up in pg &E, and we were like both blown away, like, holy crap. Uh, yeah, no, we had, when Governor Newsom made that LA Times editorial, it was basically the first time that we had heard that there's some uh, want to keep this place open. So that was followed by two different pieces of legislation. Uh, AB 205, it was a, called a utility trailer bill or energy trailer bill. It allowed the Department of Water Resources to contract with energy uh, entities to procure power. I found this really weird uh, until I realized the Department of Water Resources is actually the number one user of electricity in the state. And you think about that, they operate mm. dams, the California Aqueduct, they have hundreds and hundreds of pumps. Uh, so they use massive, massive amounts of energy. Uh, so that was, um, so they basically gave this money to DWR to say, go out and procure energy. It was like kind of a reliability standpoint. Um, then we had SD846, that was probably the most uh, talked about one in the news that reversed the previous 2018 CPC decision to close the power plant and it provided funding and a regulatory path to keep Diablo Canyon operating past 2025. Uh, I mentioned all these entities, uh, California state lands, our intake and breakwater sits on state owned property and we have a lease that allows us to put that stuff there. Uh, Governor, uh, Governor, excuse me, Governor Newsom was on the California State Lands Commission back in, uh, I think it was the early 2010s, uh, and he was one of the people that you know, saying we don't want nuclear anymore. We're not going to approve your lease extension uh, for this property unless you commit to shutting it down. Uh, so a lot of politics at play in, in kind of why we shut down and then why it got turned back around. And so now we're now, the, so the, the current um, law is extension to 2035 or is it open-ended? So it's 2030. 2030. So yeah, we also have uh, the one, yeah, so the, the ability to operate the ones through cooling system, I think that extension is to 2030. Okay. Uh, so that in the legislation, it talks about 2030. It was gonna be 10 years, now it's five. And that they're trying to figure out um, our license extension. Uh, normally a power plant, when they extend their license, it's a 20 year extension mm -hmm. after the initial 40 year. Mm -hmm. If we do it for, if we tell NRC, hey, we want five or hey, we want 20, it's the same level of effort. So we're trying to decide how mm -hmm. far do we want to try okay. and extend that license. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are still, we're still trying to figure okay. out. The legislation happened so late, the legislate, or excuse me, legislators went into recess and there's probably gonna be some cleanup bills that come okay. and provide us more context when they, when they reconvene the session in January. Okay. So this is a quick video that kind of talks about how nuclear power plants work. So if there's something I mentioned and you guys are like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Uh, <laughs> this will hopefully provide a little bit of clarity and if it, if it works, let's see. Nuclear power plants, like fossil fuel plants, produce electricity by generating steam that is used to turn a turbine and generator, which then create electricity. The primary difference between nuclear and fossil fuel plants is the fuel source that is used to produce heat, which in the case of nuclear generation, results in no greenhouse gas emissions. At nuclear power plants, the heat to make the steam is created when uranium atoms are split in a highly controlled process called fission inside the nuclear reactor. There is no combustion in the nuclear reactor. The uranium is in the form of fuel pellets that are placed into long rods and then into fuel assemblies, which are then placed inside the nuclear reactor, which is filled with water and is inside the containment dome. 
Throughout the fission process, radioactive material is designed to stay inside the fuel pellets. In this animation, the nuclear reactor is in the middle attached to the four steam generators with pipes. The fission process inside the reactor heats the water to over 600 degrees, but because it is under pressure, it is not boiling. The pumps circulate the water between the reactor and the steam generators in what is called a closed loop and keep cycling between the two components. When the heated water reaches the steam generators, it goes through thousands of tubes which transfer the heat to water in a separate system where it is turned to steam. Water from the reactor and the water that is turned into steam are in separate systems and do not mix. The steam is then piped from the steam generators in the containment dome to the turbine building. Inside the turbine building, the steam pressure is directed to large fan-like turbine blades inside the turbine housing. The blades are attached to a shaft and in turn spins for the pressure of the steam. Also attached to the shaft is the generator, which consists of a large electromagnet that turns inside a stationary coil of wire. This turning motion produces electricity. At the Apple Canyon, no priority is more pressing, no responsibility more important, and no commitment more fundamental than the safe operation of the facility. That same focus on safety extends to responding to emergencies at the plant. In addition to its controlling staff on the job 24-7, Diablo Canyon, like all U.S. nuclear power plants, maintains a highly trained and practiced emergency response organization. One of these fully staffed teams is on call 24-7 in order to take steps to protect the health and safety of the public in the event of any type of emergency at the plant. These teams deal regularly with San Luis Obispo County and other local, state, and federal authorities. In addition, multiple and redundant safety features were built into Diablo Canyon and have been updated regularly and increased since it began operating in 1985. To learn more about Diablo Canyon, we invite you to tour the plant or visit our energy education. Any questions about that? Simple. Yeah, it's easy. Easy. Anyone can do it. Yeah, that's uh, one of the most difficult things about it is that it is an incredibly complex process. We have a, the acronyms there would get crazy. We have a whole webpage dedicated just to <laughs> nuclear acronyms. Um, so, yeah, th three basic things here. So we have the, the reactor is inside the containment domes. You have the water that's under pressure, and then they have the steam generators where it's like a radiator, right? And so there's no, all the water that's irradiated in the primary loop where the reactor is, it just passes the heat like a radiator to the secondary loop. That secondary loop, that's what turns the turbines. You have the steam there. Then the ones through cooling is the third loop. Uh, and that is what causes the steam from after it's lost all of its energy and gone through the turbines, we uh, bring that back down to water so it can be pumped back and it starts the process all over again. So we use the ocean as that heat sink to re remove that last little bit of heat. So that second process there's reactor cools water that's always going to be there it's always going to be there yeah we and then the second that second flow of water that is that being cycled through right? yeah that's the ocean water that's being sucked yeah the, so it's yeah you have the primary system where it's going yeah. through the reactor the secondary side turns the turbines the third side cools everything back down to a liquid so that it can be pumped back through and the water that's discharged south of the discharge uh, structure it's about 20 degrees warmer than ambient. And- uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, yes, yeah, no 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, the, um, the impact from that warmer water is typically really close to the discharge area itself. Once it's gone through that mixing and you kind of get the heat rise in the water column, uh, you usually the first couple inches out for the last like couple hundred feet or so are what's warmer and then underneath it's just as cold as you know what the ocean temperature typically would be so the third stage is where the ocean water comes yeah from, exactly the second stage what water are you using it's it's a, it's another water? closed loop okay that yeah. all its purpose is to flash to steam and then turn the turbines and then it gets turned back into water when it hits the third loop yeah, cool. yeah. Like I said, easy piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> the, the radiated water, it's the same water that's been there. Yeah, so... Since it's open, since it's, the, it's still yeah. running? Um, I mean, they so do like have to put, water. like, makeup water in there, because like, yeah. they may have, like, a it's spill easy. of some water if they have to work, if they have to open a system up or they're working on something. Um, so we will put water 
back in there occasionally, but yeah, it's not like something that's constantly being replenished because it is a closed loop. So, and what you didn't see, like they, that water in that primary system when they had it all opened up, right? It looked kind of blue. Uh, it's because it has boron in it. And so there's a lot of physics involved, but there's also a lot of chemistry. And so boron is a neutron absorber. And so we use boron and the more boron you have in the system, the more, um, the less power you produce. So we will put boron in there to control the reaction. And then as the, when, so when you have new fuel, you have a lot of boron in there because you don't want the reaction to get out of control. And so you use the boron to control the reaction. And then as the fuel ages and it doesn't produce as much power, you slowly pull that boron out. And then the control rods that, uh, that can shut down the, the, uh, the reaction, those are like basically uh, pure boron that they put into, it goes in between all the fuel rods and that stops the reaction completely. So we would go, if in an emergency situation where they talk about scramming or tripping the reactor, we'll go from about 100% power producing 1100 megawatts per unit to zero megawatts in about five seconds. Hmm. Yeah, so the, it's an incredibly uh, quick reaction to stop. Hmm. So when incidents occur, what, like in past incidents, what part of the system usually fails? So, well, I mean, it, so Fukushima, what happened there was that they, you always have to have offsite power. So uh, the power we produce that we send off in the lines is not power we can use to run the power plant. So all the reactor coolant pumps and different things like that, all the emergency systems, we have to be able to power that somehow so we have offsite power well so in fukushima they lost all that because they had a huge earthquake completely obliterated all the transmission system so they have emergency diesel generators which are these giant like locomotive size diesel generators they fired those up and they were able to use those um well in fukushima they they thought they had the seawall that was going to protect them from tsunamis but it was way undersized and they kind of knew that uh, and when that tidal wave hit the facility it completely inundated and contaminated the fuel for those diesel generators. So it took them offline, so they had no power, they had no way to circulate the water over the fuel rods to keep it cool. And so at that point, it becomes just a matter of time. So they knew there was an issue and the water was getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Um, you start to have these weird side reactions that start to produce hydrogen. So they were getting hydrogen buildup inside of the buildings. And then there was an ignition source from the hydrogen and they had these explosions that were blowing the roofs off of it and causing all sorts of damage. Um, and it was, it's, 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 it's tough. Have, have you seen Chernobyl, like that miniseries? I'm sure like a lot of people have. I think I've seen excerpts, but not the full thing. Yeah, so they didn't have those containment domes. They didn't have any way to contain something that, like an accident. So it's a real apples to oranges comparison. We don't, the United States doesn't build reactors like that. Uh, in Japan, there's actually a book, it's a story about the, that incident. It's called um, Fukushima, a disaster made in Japan. They have a really different culture in Japan where the people making decisions at the power plant, they don't want to embarrass their superior. And so they didn't want to shut down the power plant and cause the potential embarrassment to their superior. So it took a really long time to make decisions about actually shutting the plant down and bringing it offline. In the United States, any single person working in that control room can shut it down and they don't have to ask anybody. It's their duty to shut the plant down if there is a health and safety threat to the public. They don't have to call the CEO. They don't have to call the site vice president. That person working in the control room has the authority to shut things down immediately. So it's, it's a culture issue. So it's, there's a lot of things at play. Those accidents don't, they're hard to compare. Um, but we do look at every single accident and we try to, as an industry, figure out what would we do if this happened here? And that's why, like I mentioned all that emergency equipment, we have that all stored here. So if there was an incident, they were trying to fly stuff in there and there was problems getting material out there because all their infrastructure had been so greatly destroyed. Now we have all that stuff here. We don't have to wait for it. It's all ready to go. So the industry learns as different incidents come up. Some of them are more consequential than others, unfortunately. Energy? Energy? No, no, no.
And then real quick, this is a little video about how we store our fuel at Diablo Canyon. Spent fuel. Uh, yeah, spent fuel and new fuel, it all goes in the same pool. Okay. Transferring used fuel from the pools to dry storage begins with a 15 foot tall stainless steel alloy storage canister. The canister is placed inside a separate multi-walled lead and steel transfer cask that is used to transport the internal canister to the used fuel storage pad after it is loaded. Together, they are placed into a designated location at the bottom of the spent fuel pool where workers load used fuel assemblies into the storage canister's internal grid structure. After the canister is filled with up to 32 fuel assemblies, a heavy stainless steel lid is lowered into the pool and secured to the top of the canister, which is then lifted out of the pool by an overhead crane. After the lid is welded to the top of the canister shell and moisture is removed from inside, the cask is moved to Diablo Canyon's independent spent fuel storage installation, often referred to in the industry as an ISFACI. Workers use a vertical cask transporter specifically designed That's to safely speed. transfer used fuel to the ISFACI, which is equipped with seismic restraints and bumpers. Diablo Canyon uses Holtec International's High Storm 100SA system to transfer used fuel from the pools and place it into long-term dry storage. The entire process, from the pool to the pad, meets the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's site-specific criteria and was designed with seismic safety in mind. Before the transfer cask arrives at the ISPICI, workers prepare what is called an overpack, which encases the inner canister for long-term storage. The overpack is prepared by filling its inner and outer cylindrical steel shells with concrete. As the inner canister is lowered into the overpack, seismic restraints are used. The cask is then bolted shut with a steel lid and bolted to the pad. The ISFACI was designed to anchor each cask into the pad for strength and seismic safety. Each cask is fastened to a steel plate on the pad's surface with 16 bolts. A loaded Holtec cask is 11 feet in diameter, 20 feet high, and weighs about 360,000 pounds. It is engineered to withstand extreme natural hazards and seismic events. In addition to cask strength, the ISFACI pad is located 300 feet above sea level, protecting it from a severe wave event as well as from rising sea levels that are a result of climate change. Diablo Canyon began the process of transferring used fuel to the ISFACI in 2009. The ISFACI operates under a site-specific license that is issued by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and is separate from Diablo Canyon's operating licenses. PG&E and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, so yeah, um, I'll, we'll see it later. We'll drive up past it so we don't have to go into great detail with this. but. Um, all of the fuel from our 40 year operating license is stored up there. On is, an which is crazy. On an area the size of a football field, which is, people uh, make the case that it's a lot of waste, but when you compare it to other industries, coal fire, natural gas, even solar, really in wind, it's not, it's not that much waste in comparison. Right, but we've worked on the federal containment facility for decades, right? And it keeps being, well, it's now. The other thing, 90% of the waste that we have up there right now could be recycled. But that recycling process in the United States is not currently legal. Um, so the waste issue is not, there's technical solutions to it. Um, France, they do that. Um, there are some hazardous byproducts that come about from that, but you reduce a pretty sizable amount of the waste. Uh, so real quick, uh, we mentioned a little bit about the Diablo Canyon Land Stewardship Program. Uh, so we manage all the 14 miles of coastline, it's about 12,000 acres. Uh, on average about a mile and a half inside um, or from the coastal bluffs, the, the property. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary team of professionals. We have uh, cultural resources experts. We have uh, pl land planners, biologists, it's all part of the land stewardship team. I, I, I think I know the answer, but 100% of the, the land you guys own or your subsidiary owns is in the coastal zone or is some outside the coastal Some's zone? Some's outside of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because you know the line they draw is like someone with a right, marker. Right, like, right, right, uh, right, right, right. You know, like okay. one of those things. But the, you mentioned the intake and the... It is. Is state, do you 
it's it's state lands. it's state lands and it's also coastal and it's also San Luis Obispo County and it's also BLM. <laughs> We, um, well, by definition, the state leases it. They yeah. don't, you don't buy the we, property. We right? own the stuff that's sitting on it. We don't own the property because the we, the state you cannot legally own it. The state you can have legislation that will like grant it to someone, but you can't actually they can't sell it. It's illegal for the state to sell it. So that's roughly the property line right there in Diablo Canyon. It sits right in the middle, kind of by design, make it difficult to get to. You can see there we have these people from Cal Poly that are uh, uh, doing transects. I think it's in a Cal Poly archaeology class. It's a picture of one of the wildflower blooms. Got some poppies and other things there. Um, that's the start of the Petro Coast Trail that I mentioned before. Um, so we do all sorts of things out there. We have natural and cultural resource management classes that come out. Uh, we have two grazing leases, so it's a uh, south branch and the north branch, two separate grazing leases. Uh, we manage invasive species. We also do a lot of uh, wildland field management, so we work really closely with um, Cal Fire. And we've done a number of controlled burns out here. Uh, we also have an um, uh, agreement with the county. You probably noticed coming into Avila Beach, there's only one way in and out. So imagine if there was a fire at that exit, it'd be really hard for those people to get out. So we actually bring people through the facility here and out through the mm. north property, so we have to maintain that as an emergency access. Have route. you guys had any significant wildland fires on the? Okay, but no, no, we haven't. Um, we've had a, we've worked really closely with Cal Fire to do a lot. Of, we've done a number of control burns, and not just for fuel management, but also for um, we have bishop pines mm -hmm. on site, and they only germinate with fire. And so we worked with Cal Poly to try and determine what is the correct. Um, you know, um, interval uh -huh. for that. Mm -hmm. Cal Fire would like it to burn a lot more often, uh, and Cal Poly had actually found that those bishop plans like it to be a little bit more spaced out. Um, so again, a fine balance. I mentioned the two public trails, and so you can see the people on the bishop pine thickets right there. Uh, they there's a couple of areas of the site where we're really thick with bishop pines. It's been really successful getting those to grow back. Um, we bring people out on the tide pools. I don't like to because, like I said, there's lots of plant life and <laughs> giant sea anemones all over the place, and we've had people fall in the water, and it's a, it's all bad when people are walking out there. It's really, really, really slippery. And I mentioned the fire and fuels management. Uh, so you can see there's some pictures of the controlled burns that we've done. Um, this was done many, many years ago, this little ridge line area here, and now it's just completely full of bishop pines. It's, you can't even walk through there, it's so big with bishop pines. And then uh, also work with some of that land that's to the east is owned by BLM, and so we maintain a fire break that also goes on the BLM property, so we work with them to get the appropriate permits so we can spray herbicides, because once we've created these breaks, we don't want to have to send people out there to do the mechanized removal. It's nice to be able to use herbicide and treat it that way. Um, so we're not having to send people out there to do that. Uh, do a lot of vegetation mapping. There's a number of uh, California threatened species, uh, uh, plant species that are on the site. And so we map those and uh, we use those maps. Anytime we have to uh, perform a project, we know if we're gonna be in a permitting space uh, for damage to those resources. I mentioned the grazing leases. Uh, so the North Branch, about 4,500 acre cow calf operation. Uh, organic herd utilizes rotational grazing. And the South Branch is about 5,000 acre cow calf operation with seasonal stalkers. And so uh, I'll try to hmm. get through this real quick, but hmm. this we're on two different paths. So the legislation for SB 846 there's a number of off ramps that can send us back into a decommissioning space. So obviously we've spent millions of dollars on decommissioning planning and we don't want to waste that work. So we're going to, we submitted our coastal development permit to the county. They hired a consultant to create an environmental impact report. They are in that process. They're about to release the draft environmental impact report and we would like that process to be completed. They submit that report to this uh, entity called the State Clearinghouse. At that point, we could probably idle that report, and and you mean by like December they're getting ready to release it? December or? It should okay. be released, okay. yeah. And so once that's done, we can kind of put that EAR is what we call it on the table, and then we're also at the same time planning for continued operations. 
uh, restarting the license renewal project. So that was one of the things that we learned from when we stopped license renewal the first time. We probably should have gotten it to a point where the NRC was ready to issue the license. But because we just did a complete stop, a lot of that work ended up getting wasted. So mm. we're continuing on this parallel path because we know that eventually you know, there may be an issue where we have to come offline. The legislation has put a bunch of off ramps in there where it could be California decides that they don't need it, uh, the environmental impacts are too great, or we can't get the permits we need, or the NRC won't issue the license. We're also counting on a loan from the Department of Energy. Uh, if we don't get that, it's going to completely stop the whole process. So there's lots of things that can take us offline. So is the trying. state also backing that too, the, the loan? Yeah. yeah right. So the state is giving us the money, like basically giving us a loan that would be repaid by the DOE right. grant, I guess right. is what you call it. It's not really a loan. And so some of the areas of focus, immediate issues uh, for continuing operations, like preventative maintenance, like I mentioned before, there's things that we were planning to not maintain anymore because we we're going to uh, take the facility offline. Uh, we have to go through a license renewal process with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's a very involved process. takes many, very many, it takes a lot of years. Um, seismic safety. Uh, there's a. You may have heard that Diablo Canyon needs to make a number of seismic updates or needs seismic retrofits. It's actually an urban legend. We don't have any seismic retrofits to make. If you think about it, if there was a seismic issue right now, then why would the NRC wait? until we had to relicense. The initial license is 40 years. So if you knew you had a problem at year two, where you know, they're not gonna say, oh, we'll get them in 38 years and make sure they update this. We're always constantly reviewing all seismic data and making changes to the facility based on that. Um, so there's no seismic retrofitting that needs to be done. Those have already been done, but we continue to monitor for seismic safety and conduct a lot of um, studies uh, we work with an independent review panel that looks at all the data that we collect and they make sure that we, um, that the, the studies are sound and that they, they're peer reviewed. Um, so there's a lot of work there. So you have seismologists on site? That yeah, we have a, basically we have a, an in-house consulting team that works at pg and &E okay. that's PhDs and geoscientists uh, that focus just on Diablo Canyon. Also, um, uh, hydro facilities, dam safety. Um, is a really big issue for us. So they, they look at urban dams and, and things like that. Um, just real quick through here. Uh, some people question why we had to do it so quickly. So we had SB 846, people are saying, why is this legislation needed now? Well, it takes us two years to procure the fuel for the reactors. And so if we had gotten through this fall and not ordered it, unit one would have had to shut down because we wouldn't have been able to procure fuel in a quick enough time frame. So we had, and we had no, because the CPC controls everything that we do, we couldn't just say, hey, we're gonna go buy this fuel. We need regulatory approval to do that and we need funding to do it because we have to be we're, uh, responsible for reporting all of those activities um, to the CPC. It's ratepayer money and we have to get approval to use it for every single thing that we do. We can't just spend money as we see fit. And you, you buy that from a, the federal supply yeah right? there's a supplier in uh, south carolina right. i think it's federal yeah um i'm not i am that's not really mm -hmm. my area of expertise so i'm not sure uh so yeah the fuel purchasing um spent nuclear fuel storage uh, to transport and load casts um, that's also funding that we needed um, the regulatory process i had mentioned before we needed immediate action to be able to, we couldn't even apply for these permits. We couldn't spend the money to apply for them because we didn't have that money in our general rate case. And then we had to uh, get team members redirected. So it's about 40 employees, including myself, that are part of that team. Uh, so real quick, you know, the NRC has these governing laws. There's a safety review. It looks at every single component that could possibly be safety related in the power plant. So if you have a pipe, um, you know, they look at wall thickness the thickness of the pipe has degraded over time from just friction loss or, uh, or whatever, uh, corrosion, you have to show how you're gonna manage that for the next 20 years of the license renewal period. So there's a lot, basically you could fill up, you know, a library with the size of the application that looks at every single pipe, every fitting, every bolt, you could, it could possibly be a safety issue is, is uh, managed under what's called an aging management plan. And so, that's the bulk of the license renewal process. We also have an environmental re review. So it's a NEPA process that's initiated by the NRC. 
So they'll consult with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a member of other federal entities. Uh, and so they, they look at all the um, environmental impacts. And fortunately, because we did all this decommissioning work where we were doing marine studies, bio studies, and all these terrestrial uh, related impacts, we have all this data that we can kind of plug into that. And the CEQA process, California Environmental Equality Act process, is much more rigorous than the NEPA process. Uh, so we have a lot more data than we than we probably need for the NEPA process. So we're, we're well situated for that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mentioned before, we had completed about 80 or 90% of the application that we submitted in 2009, and then we withdrew in 2016. Uh, so right now we're waiting on the NRC to make a decision. Do we need to submit a new application, or will they just take our old application and put it into the renewal pro or, um I forget what the word is for it. Um, reinstated. Will they reinstate the old application? It would save us a lot of time. So we're waiting on a decision from them for that. Uh, I mentioned the seismic studies. Um, you know, none of these seismic studies are needed for license renewal from the NRC. We maintain a long-term seismic program. It includes continuing evaluation, and we have an independent peer review panel that meets uh, annually. So it looks at all that. Uh, there's a quick schedule we expect. We're going to be probably submitting our lease to operate the facility, the uh, intake and discharge facilities, our California state lands lease amendment, probably in December of this year. Um, we'll submit our NRC license renewal application in uh, probably fourth quarter next year. And that's basically about it. Do you guys have any questions about permitting or regulatory stuff? Good. Thank you.